Aloha, welcome to Figments on Reality Season 2, Episode 4. It's actually, I think, the 34th various uh, various uh, types of figments I've done in less than a year. That's amazing to me. And uh, today I'm going to cover the waterfront, lit literally and figuratively. I've been looking at the headlines, as I said I would, and pick some topics that uh, I think are worth addressing, looking both at what's new and what's really news. I think there's some confusion on that. So uh, here's my list, or before we get to the list rather, let me talk about the concept for figments on reality for new viewers, and I hope there's some of those. Hey, I'm apolitical. It's not that I don't care about politics, it's that I don't care to commentant, commentate on politics specifically because I think it dilutes the, uh, the arguments that I wanna make, the, the views that I have. My politics are between me and the voting box. And secondly, uh, I'm so tired of vitriol in today's world. I just don't want to be vitriolic and angry and hateful when I talk about things. Some things really do annoy me. Uh, there's a, I sometimes say there's a global conspiracy to make me mad. You can use your own phrase there, I do. Uh, but that's not true. And life isn't that bad. So now we can take a look at the topic list, a bunch of things that have caught my attention. You see them all there. I'll click through those. Uh, and uh, for in case you're viewing and want to fast forward or view and then want to return to the topic, I'll have a little header there for each one. So they're easy to find thinking about you, the viewer. The first topic is appropriate because today is the 6th of December, 2021. And that means that tomorrow is the 80th anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. I'd ask you to imagine that in the morning, the attack. I, I spend a lot of time on Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. And every time I go there and see the Arizona Memorial, the Missouri battleship, where the surrender was signed in Tokyo Bay, um, I can't help but visualize how shocking and tragic it must have been and remember it wasn't just military casualties or many civilian casualties some from falling anti-aircraft rounds that what goes up must come down and, and it did so it was tragic in that sense and I, I can't imagine how they looked at their holiday season yeah uh, after the attack with lots of darkness on the horizon and many defeats in the philippines elsewhere the uh, uh, Nazi threat in Europe, it, it must have been very difficult to see anything positive. And the reason I bring that up today is that uh, this has not been a great couple of years with COVID and everything else, but it could be worse. And we need to be thankful for our blessings. So I wish you all uh, uh, happy holidays, all holidays, all people, um, but it shouldn't be controversial to wish people well, but it seems it is that day. But let's let's realize that we don't have it that bad. We're much blessed despite the challenges we face. And I'll talk about some of those challenges uh, as well. In addition to the 7th of, Ju 7th of December 80th anniversary uh, event, tomorrow I'll attend the commissioning of the USS Daniel K. Inouye uh, naval warship uh, down at Pearl Harbor, and that's germane to the aftermath of, of the actual attack because, like many Japanese Americans, uh, Senator, then later Senator in a way, uh, Congressional Medal of Honor recipient, had to fight for the opportunity to fight for his country. Think about that with tens of thousands of Japanese and Americans interred in camps around the country, and not here in Hawaii, but in California principally, uh, he still fought for the opportunity to fight. Uh, and we should honor that by being more inclusive in our society of all of our American citizens. And I'm not excluding immigrants, I'm married to one, but, but uh, those who choose to fight for our country should be revered and respected regardless of any discriminator we've got. Um, another thought on um, 
Pearl Harbor goes to a place that I'm affiliated with and I'm a member of the board of directors. So I'm absolutely biased in this regard. And that's the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum right there on Fort Island. We just held our annual fundraising gala. So it is in the headlines to some degree. If you've never been there, go there. If you can't go there in person, attend FAM events virtually. They have some great webinar webinars, a couple of which I've hosted on the Battle of Midway and um, another one on underwater archaeology of uh, wrecked aircraft. It is a great place and it's on a unique place on a battlefield where the attack actually began. And Hangar 79 houses many of our exhibited aircraft and it has the pock marks of the attack, bullet holes, uh, fragment chips out of the out of the structure, bullet holes in the window. And we, the museum has a tremendous team of docents, uh, curators, restorers, and staff. It, it's an educational experience that will be truly an experience, something where you can take on board that moment, those horrible moments of December 7th, 1941. I mentioned Hangar 79. One of the challenges the museum faces is that's a historic building with a very leaky roof. It's a rainy week in Hawaii, some storms flooding already on Maui and very heavy weather predicted for Oahu later today. Uh, we've got to repair that. And so the fundraising this year is focused on raise the roof. And what they really mean is repair the roof so that we can stabilize our exhibitry and better tell the story of uh, Pearl Harbor and beyond. So please visit the uh, Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum website and consider donating to that very worthy uh, museum. So uh, the next topic I wanna to talk about, I'm a little hesitant to because we're all so darn tired of it and that's COVID-19 and the Omicron variant. We shouldn't be surprised that there is another variant. That's what happens with viruses. And it appears that this is quite contagious, um, but not very deadly, mild symptoms. I'm not aware of any specific Omicron variant deaths, but it's another challenge for um, our response to the pandemic. And uh, as we make that response, I think the country and our officials at every level, federal, state, municipal, need to do a better job of risk benefit analysis because the disease is not the only risk. The human toll of restrictions, both personal, psychological, and uh, economic are just as important as the disease itself. And there has to be a better balance in choosing what is done and what isn't done. And on avoiding government overreach. Um, the city of New York is about to impose a mandate for, for vaccines from all private employees. And I'm sorry, I'm vaccinated, thrice vaccinated. I believe in the vaccine, but that's government overreach, telling people what they have to put in their body to work. I think there's a better solution. And that better solution is something I saw done in Chile, uh, where they issue mobility cards. So if you're vaccinated, you can get a card that allows you the opportunity to to move freely and interact freely in society. And if you don't have the card, there are certain things you can't do. Okay? I think that's a reasonable approach uh, and less invasive than a broad mandate that uh, makes you get a vaccine or excludes you uh, arbitrarily and makes you report your vaccine status. The mobility card is a choice and many in Chile have chosen to get it. I think it's a better approach in a local note, uh, I'm doing some business with the state of Hawaii that uh, requires interaction with the state capital. It's closed. It's still closed for the pandemic. So everything I do has to be mailed in, mailed back, mailed in. I'm on my third iteration that I don't understand that. What's the risk? State courts are open. Other, many other offices are open. State of Hawaii, open your capital, get back to work. Um, state employees had priority for the vaccines. The capital should be open. And uh, I, I really, truly do not understand why it is still closed. 
So quick break. Boy, this is going pretty fast. I may have to stretch it out, but I won't. To tell you that um, Figment's The Power of Imagination next Monday, December 13th, 2 o'clock p.m. Hawaii Standard Time for the live broadcast. Of course, we will share the uh, YouTube link for uh, later viewing. We're going to kind of revisit Imagining the Unimaginable. My Black Swan episode a couple weeks ago did that. And uh, now I'm going to talk about things that are personally unimaginable. I have a friend, former colleague, F-15 fighter pilot, who lost a son to suicide. And that's a tough topic to address, but thankfully he's willing to do it. And we're going to talk about the experience, the lessons, and some advice for those who have the opportunity still to avoid such a tragedy, but also for those who may experience one. Um, heavy stuff worth talking about. So back to the news. <laughs> Great. We've got lots of tensions between China and Taiwan and the U.S. peripherally, not so peripherally, and Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, today it was announced that the U.S. is going to conduct a diplomatic uh, boycott of the Beijing Olympics. And uh, I suppose you can justify that. I'd just say it's largely symbolic. And we've got to do other real things to deter Chinese adventurism, not to seek conflict. In fact, just the opposite with China. And it's very important that our deterrence is effective and that it's a balanced relationship with the country that's going to be part of a major part of this century, regardless of what we do. Uh, but the real deterrence is real important. I have a concern that we're ignoring the lessons of Pearl Harbor, and you can find some pieces on the internet that say that, and sticking with our legacy approaches in, uh, first of all, it could happen, a conflict between China and Taiwan, or a forceful reunification, to use their preferred uh, verbiage, uh, and the U.S. could easily be drawn in or excluded by the threat of Chinese weapons. Um, we can't simply rely on legacy capabilities like aircraft carriers and, and other things. And my view is the most important uh, capability to invest in is missile defense. I didn't used to feel that way 10 or 15 years ago when I was still in the Air Force. I didn't think it was as imperative as it is now. But when you look at the potential missile threat to U.S. territory in Guam, to uh, the state of Hawaii and to the broader US, given the expanded missile and weapon capability that China is aggressively pursuing, we have to deter that with effective and innovative defense. Cost is funny, folks, I understand that, but um, it is an imperative if we're going to uh, successfully deter conflict and forge a world where US and China truly coexist and uh, we avoid conflict. Pardon me, we'll have a sip of hot tea on this cold, wet morning. <laughs> on Russia, Ukraine, lots of reports that Russia is planning to invade the Ukraine, invade the Ukraine. That would be bad. And uh, the US is actively trying to prevent that from happen, happening, but it could happen. And, I think that's my message on both China, Taiwan, and Russia, Ukraine. These things could happen, folks. And um, we need to ensure that our elected leaders and our military are acknowledging the reality and not, not simply wishing it away. Can't be caught by surprise like we were 80 years ago. Um, and to do that, we've got to complicate the risk-benefit analysis and it isn't pure military confrontation. I, I don't know that China will feel much pain from the symbolic diplomatic boycott, but there are other ways to complicate their risk benefit analysis. Uh, and the same for Russia. They have to recognize that it's not worth it. And uh, across the spectrum, not purely military, but economic, diplomatic, uh, whatever ways their adventurism, word I may overuse, but it fits, can be impeded and deterred. 
we have to pursue them aggressively. And I'm not sure we should always put them in the news, by the way. Uh, I don't, I'm sure there's some secret diplomacy going on. I hope it's being worked hard and worked with a, with a realistic sense that these, these things that seem unimaginable in 2021 are in fact possible. Um, part of getting ready for such circumstances is running our government so that we can have our capabilities. And okay, this one does make me mad. Not at a party, because both parties have failed. But once again, the U.S. government is running under a conditional resolution. A conditional resolution means that the Congress has failed to pass a budget. Again, not the first time. In fact, since, 2020, since 2001, we've had continuing resolutions 15 times, including this year. 15 times. Now, Congress likes to tout its power of the purse strings and the, uh, the acquisition of funds and the distribution of funds is a power of the purse string that starts with the House of Representatives. Our founding fathers intended to have the money stay as close to the people who provided it, people like you and me, um, through the House of Representatives. So the job starts there. It takes the Senate to pass a budget and get it implemented. They haven't done it for 15 times, 15 times in the last 21 years. That's a fail, folks. And we should all be mad as hell because it costs us money. Yeah, there's the uncertainty. And at times we have government shutdowns where government workers aren't paid but it costs us money because it introduces starts and stops in every government, in many government activities, like defense procurement. And having worked formerly for a defense contractor, I know that costs money. It costs money to our workforce. It increases the price of what we're buying, whether it's a bridge or a bomber. And it costs you money that your congressman can't do their job. And we ought to be angry. So here's my proposal. I don't think term limits will ever be enacted. I just, it's hard to imagine a, a political body uh, doing that to itself, an elected body. So I don't think they're gonna be term limits anytime soon, but I have another idea. How about a mandatory um, performance requirement where if a congressman enters office on a, two, a, a representative on a two-year term and in neat, neither year is a budget passed in time to avoid the continuation, continuing resolution. They can't run for office. They can't run for re-election. We could have a similar criteria for the Senate or four out of six, three out of six. You're out. You didn't do your job. It's not a matter of politics. It's a matter of performance. And they're not being held accountable. And some sort of restriction on seeking reelection if you don't do your job makes sense to me. And again, if that's not uh, specific to a political party or even an individual, but they have to perform and they're not. Pardon me. Speaking of that, speaking of performance. Another area where I see the uh, recurring challenges in our elected officials is their departure from office, whether for a term limit, say governors or, or other offices that do in fact have term limits, or at the end of their uh, career when they retire. I think for all elected officials who receive a pension from the state or the federal government, those who elected them should have a chance to vote on the percentage of possible pension they get. So let's say somebody's leaving the House of Representatives after two or 20 years of service, their constituents should have an opportunity to vote in the, in the election they choose not to or not allowed to run for, how much of their pension they get. They did a good, and, and I think voters are pretty kind, considerate, but it's still their money. So if um, Representative X did a great job, maybe the voters vote 100% of the maximum possible pension. If they didn't, 
maybe they vote 50. You wouldn't want to make it zero. Well, I, there are a couple of cases where I might want to make it zero, but that's not realistic. But they ha we have to ensure that lame duck elected officials retain some skin in the game, that they have something to lose if they don't do their jobs. And I think that's one way to do it. So that's my idea. Write your congressman and propose it. And who knows? I am an optimist, generally. But that said, it's hard to be optimistic sometimes when you look at things we've had in the news. And uh, in the past week, uh, we've had two really preventable tragedies, both tragic in Wisconsin. Uh, driver drove his SUV into a crowd intentionally by all appearances, killing many and, and injuring others. And in a Michigan high school, a uh, 15-year-old boy apparently shot up his uh, classroom and killed four students. Uh, these are tragic in their own right. They're perhaps doubly tragic because both were completely preventable. In the parade rampage case, the perpetrator had was a career criminal. He'd been let out on bond for a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars didn't have to happen. He could have been incarcerated. Now, I think we have a a problem with. Uh, over incarceration, our prisons are too full. But what that really is, is a failure to differentiate between those who truly pose a risk to society and those who um, maybe are an annoyance or could be better dealt with in other ways. Annoyance is an understatement if you're the victim. But there are some people who belong in jail and don't belong out on a $1,000 bail. And this guy was one of them. Clearly, in the school shooting case, and it's hard, uh, man, it's just sad as I, I, I can't imagine anything sadder. Um, the parents appear to be culpable and have been charged with uh, uh, a crime, each of them, and are held on $500,000 bail, each of them, um, for their role in providing the weapon and not impeding the son. But it appears the school is just as complicit because there were ample warning signs and uh, they didn't act upon them. They had him in his office. They suggested to the parents that the parents um, take him home and the parents refused. And soon thereafter, he killed four of his classmates. Why is that? I think it's because of lawyers. The school is afraid to be heavy handed. Um, because they might face a complaint or a lawsuit. That's my supposition. We'll see how it all plays out. But the, the fact that we can litigate everything between a spilt cup of coffee at McDonald's that burns somebody because it's, here's a surprise, hot, and a threat like this where you have a kid who's manifesting behavior that clearly is a threat to his classmates and himself, and we can't deal with it, come on, sad. We have to be able to differentiate and do those things that are really important. And to do that, we have to be less litigious, more on that in a bit. And my last story that I want to talk about today is a little bit personal, and that's the uh, conviction by a military court, closed court, of Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar, also known as Burma and her uh, sentence of four years now brought down upon appeal, that all happened pretty quick, uh, of, uh, to two years. But um, I had the opportunity to meet Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar a couple of times, met her here in Hawaii, a remarkable human being, Nobel Prize laureate, um, mixed uh, to net slightly negative, maybe negative reviews in her role in governing the new democracy in Myanmar after the junta finally was deposed prior to them executing another military coup, uh, but a remarkable human being. Her crimes were, uh, there were two crimes. One was incitement and the other, wait for it, was violating COVID restrictions. So an authoritarian government used COVID restrictions against one of their opponents. 
Hmm. I don't think those who worry about government overreach on COVID restrictions are wrong. And I am concerned about it. I mask up, I'm vaccinated, but I'm concerned about it. And uh, I think, you know, allowing excessive power, and I think the, the good example is this vaccine mandate in New York City is dangerous and can have long-term effects. Um, so, okay, whew, that's a long list of stuff that's been on my mind. I invite you to write to me at info at phase minus one.com if you have stuff that's been on your mind that you'd like to talk about. But despite the long list and the daunting issues, now it's time to talk about what would Fig do? What would I do? It'd be a realist, not a pessimist. Um, it's the holiday season. We've got a wonderful family and I'm much blessed by my family, friends, and the things I get to do, um, both on ThinkTech and elsewhere. But you need to be a realist. And that means to prepare uh, for disasters that could happen, like flooding. It's starting to rain really hard here and other issues. Uh, protect yourself from the virus and do all that. Uh, but also participate. And participating in these matters is a question of voting, vote, vote, vote. Only once for election, please, but vote. And opine, share your opinion uh, in whatever way you like. I don't recommend Facebook. I do recommend because it just becomes part of the noise. I do remember, recommend letters to your elected representatives uh, or emails or however they uh, seek voter feedback, and they all do. Um, so vote and opine. The last thing go, I'd like to go back to is my discussion of the role of the law in limiting our ability to differentiate between the truly important and things that are not as important. We need to seek to make our country less litigious. I like that word, litigious. It means we sue less. Here's what it means. I'm going to read it to you so I get it right. It's an adjective of relating to or characterized by litigation tending to engage in lawsuits, inclined to initiate lawsuits given to the practice of contending in law or finally fond of litigation. I wonder if you can hear the heavy rain around me right now. Um, that's the way our country is right now and it's not good for our country. I don't have an easy answer. I'm not blaming the lawyers because the lawyers are lawyers because there's a market for them. But a broad goal of the entire population should be settling things before they get to the state of, laws of lawsuits and litigation. Um, and especially when they're relatively trivial things that can be solved without that approach. So those are my thoughts. Holy cow, it's time already. We've reached another, the end of another broadcast of Figments on Realities. I thank you for attention. I for your attention. I really thank Think Tech Y for allowing me to be a citizen journalist, both in Figments on Reality and as you'll see next week again, Figments: The Power of Imagination. Stay positive. Be prepared. I'll see you soon. Aloha.